Hi guys, how are you? Welcome back. Let's do another video, and we're gonna stump the chump. <laughs> All right, let's listen to what Norm has to say. Maybe some fiscal problems ahead with the end of the enhanced unemployment benefits that starts next month, June 12th, a bunch of states, 23 states in all so far have said that they're going to end the program early. program is slated to end September 16th, but 23 states are pulling out because they think it is keeping people home and people are not working. We'll see. Look, I talk about this on the podcast. What you don't want to do is slow down or curtail or end net transfers from the government that those are income transfers. Let's rewind a little bit and hear that again. Is slow down or curtail or end net transfers from the government that those are income transfers and that's no good. I mean that you know, Oh boy. Okay. So let's cover this one more time. Since 2007, when the debt was 10 trillion, we've added another 18 trillion. Okay? And for that 18 trillion, we got 3.5 trillion. 3.5 trillion of real GDP growth. Not growth, but GDP. The return on investment on that is horrible. Okay? It's horrible. So, Mike is in outer space. <laughs> okay? He's completely in outer space. You get 20% GDP growth from the $18 trillion, Okay? 20%. What if you didn't deficit spend and you just balanced the budget like Australia? Do you think we still would have got $3.5 trillion over the course of 14 years? Of course we would have. Of course. That goes without saying. Okay. So you can see that deficits don't uh, become transfer income or whatever the hell you said. They're, they're not... They're not going to do anything. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, they crowd out investment. Okay? They crowd out investment. And we just learned now that Biden uh, proposed $6 trillion more. Well, guess what? The previous $6 trillion got us negative GDP growth. Negative. Negative. For $6 trillion. That's, that's what you got. You got negative GDP growth. Discussion back and forth about people working and jobs, but you need buying power for any business to run. I mean, businesses depend on consumers. They depend on sales, selling their products and services. People need buying power. Anyway. People need buying power. Yes. Yes, they do. And it doesn't come from government. <laughs> That's why you only got $3.5 trillion for $18 trillion worth of, uh, of added public debt. I'm not even going to add the private debt. Forget about that. Let's skip it. What does he know about business? Nothing. That's what he knows. Uh, has anybody gotten richer from the 95% because of the added $18 trillion? No. <laughs> they haven't. And we have the absolute best demographics that you could possibly have right now. Millennials that are right at that, you know, sweet spot of the in their 30s, right? They're going to be going out spending, right? Nice clothes, nice car, little fucking is sucking. Some babies come out, strollers, houses, right? Baby rooms. So where's 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 all this economic growth? Negative for the last six trillion, right? Corporate profits are at all time high. That's kind of cool, huh? 
in the middle of a pandemic look yeah. <laughs> look at that wow we're printing for the people we're printing for the people right uh, let's listen what he's got to say uh this is not what i want to talk about in this video yeah not, don't you know it's been <laughs> it's been fun to watch how the inflation hysteria the whole inflation meme conversation is starting to completely evaporate some of the diet <laughs> did it completely evaporate wow okay pce came in today at uh what three three percent <laughs> i have no idea what evaporated okay um no idea what he's talking about we still have inflation uh let's take a look at uh, commodities here let's take a look at commodities oh check it out commodities yes yes they're looking great they're actually breaking out as we speak hysteria hmm let's take a look at copper Ooh, yeah that's going straight up yep so again you know you listen to people like this with the, their stupid uh, mmt economics you'll never get anywhere with them All right, let's listen I heart inflationistas now switching over to the deflation camp today we had another really strong two-year auction uh, rates were down again what does a two-year auction have to do with deflation <laughs> he's all over the place he just he just throws shit up up against the wall see what sticks who cares about the two-year auction anybody did anybody care about the previous auction? Does anybody even know anything? <laughs> well, boy, if I throw that auction, you know, I was examining it. You know, I'm on top of things. You know, I uh, I examine every little nook and cranny. You know, I'm uh, I'm an analyst. Uh, the auction went well. When has a two-year auction not gone well? I'm waiting. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, well, they have to be credit worthy. Well, fuck, no bank is going to make a, a loan unless they're credit worthy. What does credit, cre credit worthy mean? Well, it depends whatever the, the bank uh, profit margins are, right? Whatever they deem to be worthy. And they don't really much care because the government would bail them out, right? So, anyway. Look, I don't think, like I said before, I, I don't think we were going to have inflation, certainly not hyperinflation. You know, I did that video a couple of months. Who's talking about hyperinflation? Nobody. Why did he throw it out there? Straw man argument. Well, I'll say uh, hyperinflation and then I'll look smart. Stupid. It's back about that guy. By the way, he never saw inflation coming to begin with, right? He never saw it coming. <laughs> he never saw it coming. Uh, the big short guy, Michael J. Burry, who was talking about an inf a hyperinflation. I mean, that was nonsense. You could go back and listen to the video I did at that time. I mean, he's talking about 10 years ago to give himself credibility that we were not going to have uh, inf uh, hyperinflation uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, by the way, the, the two year auction went great today. For me, when I heard that back then, and I think I said this, it, it showed me that this guy, the big short, who supposedly made all his money selling subprime, who he's a guy who's more lucky than smart. And maybe he's a physician, a doctor, I think he is. So, you know, he's smart in that aspect. He went to school, he got, a, a, he got certified. <laughs> he went to... <laughs> He went to he went to school to become a doctor, so he's smart, but he's stupid and he's lucky. And I said he was wrong when everybody was saying hyperinflation. <laughs> oh my God! Wow, you're amazing, dude. <laughs> People listen to this guy. Crazy. As a medical doctor, but when you start saying things like this, that you know uh, we're gonna have hyperinflation. I mean, you don't understand. I mean, the guy just doesn't understand. And a lot of these quacks and people, and not just the quacks, all right? We've had some serious 
Wall Street people, serious finance people talking about the same thing. I don't know, like, how many times do we have to run through the numbers where you can see that monetary growth, the monetary base, or the federal debt, which is essentially all the dollars printed, take uh, uh, subtracting the uh, you know taxes that were taken away. So all the dollars in existence, I mean, that has gone parabolic. We know it's gone from like virtually nothing back in Reagan days to 28 trillion now. Uh, inflation just collapsed over that period of time. And yes, in the last year, we saw price increases in a fairly large number of areas in the economy, but those things are already starting to moderate. <laughs> he started the, the video with, oh, there's no inflation. And now he, then he went to deflation. Then he went to the two-year bond. Then he started talking about some guy that said hyperinflation 10 years ago. And now prices are rising. Yeah, that's true. But they're moderating. <laughs> all over the place. All over. The, he just throws fucking shit up against the wall. And he calls himself a macroeconomist analyst. And he knows about business. The fact that prices have risen is inflation. Period. 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 Commodities are going through the roof. Period. <laughs> it, it, you cannot change that. Anyway, so the inflation, now they're talking about deflation. Look, I don't think it's going to be either one. I mean, it's not going to be inflation, nor do I think we're going to have deflation. He just got done saying the prices rose, and now there's no inflation. And now he's starting to put another straw man argument there that we're going to have deflation now. <laughs> If you understood how b stupid and bad that sounds to somebody that understands economics, you would be banging your head up against the wall. Like, why would anybody listen to this guy? Why? Why? He's the guy that said, oh, no, you know, if you raise interest rates, that's, uh, that's bad for inflation. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, the, the lira keeps collapsing. <laughs> Hello? You know, every time you lower interest rates, Lira goes, whoosh, poof. <laughs> How many times has, does he have to say it and I show it for him to pick up that he's wrong, like Mosler? We could have a period, a brief period, where I, I talked about this yesterday, where uh, because of the response on the part of businesses, on the part of producers, who have been unable to meet demand because of pandemic-related factors, now starting to ramp up production to very high levels, we may see a period, a brief period, maybe a few months, maybe six months, maybe less, where supply comes back on in a big way and prices come down. In what universe are prices going to come down after they were raised uh, thanks to commodity inflation? And what, you know, you think Coca-Cola's, I've said this a million times, Coca-Cola's going to come out and be like, oh, we're, we're lowering price on the, on the can of Coke. Oh, now we're going to have an oversupply now. Oh, okay. Does he realize that we live in an automated uh, world and there's no amount of demand that we cannot meet? It's not inflation because we cannot meet demand. There's, there is no such thing. Even, even when you look at the semiconductors, okay, and they have a shortage and whatever, blah, 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 okay, look at them. They have not risen since February 12th. They're stuck in this little 2% range, 2.5% range. They've fallen, yeah, okay, but they haven't gone anywhere. So, where is the pricing power? You think the market is stupid that they, they would see some kind of uh, price appreciation because there's not enough uh, supply to meet demand and they're just going to sit there and be like, well, I'm not going to buy that. Nah, nah, I'm not going to buy that. What? what? <laughs> you know why he's touching his face? Because he's uncomfortable with the stupid shit he's saying because what he's saying is completely dumb.
But you're not gonna, you know, when you when you have when you mention these terms, wait, 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 inflation, wait, 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 deflation. You stuttering motherfucker. <laughs> you, you can't talk about these things as one-off events. All right. If you have a supply shock, which we had in the pandemic, and it's a one-off event, and then things start to abate, and those pressures start to dip. Supply shock. We had a I, I didn't even know it. You know why I didn't know it? Because there wasn't any demand. That's why there was <laughs> nobody noticed the supply shock. Dissipate. That's not inflation, and vice versa. On a deflation, if you have now um, uh, an, an an inverse, a reverse supply shock, where a lot of supply suddenly hits the market and prices come down uh, to a new equilibrium level. That that's prices are not coming down. Okay, they're not coming down. It's not deflation either. That that's a market adjustment to prior conditions that cause something, you know, to be out of whack. A lot of times I talk about, you know, what drives inflation. You got to have something broken in the system or you have to have some monopolistic force. So we had something broken for a year. It was the pandemic and, you know, that's what caused that. And now and we had no inflation. <laughs> inflation was in the gutter. In the gutter. Why? Because it was in demand. Okay, so whatever supply shock you had didn't matter because there was no demand. The, 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 the commodity prices started to rise, and you can see it here. They started to rise right as we started to print like there was no tomorrow. Here it is, down here. What's the bottom here? <clears throat> April 21st, 2020. And then what happened? We it started to go up and 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 up. Okay, it's not because uh, supply shock. Was there a supply shock in oil? <laughs> right? There's no supply shock in oil. The, the, if anything, we were crying that there was too much oil. But look at where it's at. Sixty-six dollars today. Why? Why? Because it was a supply shock. Come on. Come on, give me a fucking break. The response to that, and it, it may not even be what I'm saying, but I, I, I have, uh, yeah, I do nothing. believe that we can see uh, this sort of uh, reverse supply shock where a lot of supply hits the market now as businesses come back on stream and ramp up and stuff like that, and we see prices come down. But that's, that's not a deflation either. It's just an adjustment to... A period where you know prices went too high and businesses were not able to produce but it's fascinating to see I mean if you've been following it like me yeah if you've been following like he has <laughs> and you read the comments and the the stuff on the internet the stuff online and the commentary you know it has shifted 180 degrees Right. And all of a sudden now they're like, well, I guess the Fed's not going to raise interest rates, even though the Fed was telling everybody that. And Powell's going to come out of this looking like a genius because he was the one who said it's transitory. It's transitory. There were even uh, other members of the FOMC, you know, who were hinting at rate increases. Now, Powell looks like the smart guy here, because it's going to end up to be um, a temporary thing, transitory, just like he said. So that's where we are. So Powell's going to look good after he just admitted that prices have risen, and that's inflation. And he's going to say, well, it's transitory. Transitory means that it goes up for a little bit and then comes back down. Prices have risen. They're not going to go back down. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Commodities might come down, sure, at some point. Okay. But, um, you know, if you're going to start printing another $6 trillion, uh, don't hold your breath. Don't hold your breath. But you see how he's mix matching what the price in the real economy is versus commodities. They're not the same thing. Don't confuse the two. See, if, if you don't listen closely to what he's doing, you're not going to pick up on that. On the one hand, he's saying prices will come down. Okay, let's say they come down, um, you know, in commodities. 
okay let's say oil comes down to forty dollars because now we don't have a supply shock <laughs> as if we had one to begin with but anyway okay it comes down to forty dollars okay let's say that oil comes uh, oil prices gas prices come down okay fine is coca-cola price going to come down nope um 42 percent of cpi is housing uh let's say homes do come down okay because of commodity prices well isn't that a recession because if you're going to have these home prices start to fucking drop like a rock right <laughs> that's going to cause a lot of jobs in construction because new home sales will start tanking you're not going to make more more homes to sell uh for for less right uh so that would be a recession you can't have it all ways my friend you can't just make shit up as you go and just throw it out there to the layman and they'll buy it they'll eat it but they don't understand what they're talking about for commodity prices to come down fed has to taper if the fed is tapering uh then you're probably going to end up in a recession okay uh, it's just that simple because the stock market is so juiced up on, li uh, on liquidity, so juiced up, that you start tapering, you start taking away the punch bowl, that stock market is going to go <laughs> straight down as quickly as it came up, maybe even faster. Okay? Uh, and then what? Then what are you going to say? Oh, now it's deflation, but I didn't say it was deflation. Prices are stable. He's all over the place. Like... Again, to someone who understands what he's saying, you want to bang your head up against the wall. It's, it's like going blah, 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 gibberish. doesn't make any sense what he's saying. Conditions, so you got to stay focused. And one thing I talk about in the... <laughs> yeah, now, now you have to be focused. He's all over the place. He's confused. He, he's just throwing shit up against the wall. And now you got to stay focused. right? Why is he saying that? Because he knows he's not focused. He knows what he's saying is stupid. He knows that he, he, to somebody that understands what he's saying, he's ridiculous. So now, now, now he wants to project that hey, you know, you got to stay focused. You know, guys like him that keep up with these things, they follow it. Please. Please. Uh, podcast today with respect to my experience in that Grand Canyon hike was at the end. And I may have mentioned this yesterday, I don't know, but if you listen to the podcast, you'll hear me talk about it. At the end, when I was completely physically exhausted and when, what you know, the top of the canyon rim still seemed so far away. What in the world? <laughs> the Grand Canyon. <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? He's lost it. Uh, he's got dementia or something. The Grand Canyon. <laughs> What about the bond sale? How did that, the bond auction, how did that go? Way I had hours left to go after I had already walked like 12 hours and I was looking up at the canyon rim and it was just so far away that, you know, looking at that, it, if I were to focus on that, I mean, it, it would shut me down. Phys he just said we have to focus. Now he's saying that if he was focused on the on the peak or whatever the hell he was he was looking at then it would have shut him down holy shit he's done i think his brain is mush that's it too much drugs it's turning to gel wow physically wow. i mean literally i would want to just lay oh. down and stop walking so i really had to narrow my focus it had to become like a singular focus on one thing which was just like putting one foot in front of another don't think about the time left don't think about the top the rim of the canyon just like one foot in front of another just like you got to narrow it way down to you know the basic thing that you have to do next so the reason I'm saying this is because, you know, for me, it always comes back to the fiscal flows. <laughs> so we went from the Grand Canyon, but he was puking <laughs> to the fiscal flows now. Oh. I look at those numbers every single day. I have that every single day. And there's a lot of noise outside of that. 
And there's a lot of things that can derail you. So many things. I mean, if you read the financial news, if you watch these stupid uh, business shows, um, commentary, online, blogs, this and that, if you stare at the markets moving up and down and all over the place, so many things can trip you up. You got to have that singular focus. And the most important thing, the underlying macroeconomic fundamental, the thing, the base thing are those fiscal flows. And I come back to that. And that guides me. That keeps me on track. Just like when I had to think about. What the fuck is he talking about? Okay. <laughs> the economy went like this. The fiscal flows went like that. And it keeps him focused. I have no idea what that means. None. None. I don't. I don't did the fiscal flows tell him the for the crystal ball the COVID was coming? We're going to go into economic depression. No. <laughs> right. Did the six trillion of fiscal flows tell him that hey we're going to have negative GDP growth? No. <laughs> but it kept them on track. Don't listen to the uh, business shows. Don't uh, listen to people. And he read the comments. Comments from who? Who? What comments did he read? bunch of uh, know nothings just blubbering who cares about the the comments straw man arguments stupid uh, fiscal flows grand canyon auctions deflation inflation it's none of that but prices have risen it, the guy is a disaster and I, I i honestly i feel bad for him i think he's, he's you know he's gonna have to go see a doctor or something just putting one foot in front of the other when I was walking up that canyon. Oh, my God. Because if I looked at the rim or if I looked at my watch, forget it. I'd still be there right now. So same mentality applies. All right? And so having said that, things are still good. Things are still positive. But I will reiterate that starting next month, Got to keep a really sharp eye on those numbers because when these states start ending that income transfer. Wow. Seriously, just wow. <laughs> yeah, guys, guys lost it completely. Um, anyway, let, let me just show you this before we go. The, the debt in 2019 ended up with 22 point six point seven trillion dollars today it's 28 28 and change 28.1 or something okay so we've added six trillion dollars whoops we've added six trillion dollars and we got no economic growth all right that's just the facts this so you can sit here and talk about fiscal flows and whatever the hell you want you have high unemployment you have inflation uh, that's not going to change, okay? Price is not coming down. Don't listen to this guy. Don't listen to people like him. Um, nobody gives a shit about the two-year bond auction, okay? Because it's, it's never gone bad. And, and when it does go bad, believe me, it's too late. Uh, the only way commodity prices are coming down is two ways. You start tapering or you raise interest rates. Well, first you have to taper and then you're going to raise interest rates. Uh, okay, and and that's just that simple. How high are they going to go? Nobody knows. Okay, but they have broken out on the chart, and typically that means there's going to be a lot of room for it to run. Um, Biden is now introducing another six trillion. Doesn't mean that it's going to pass, but you can see the trillions are here to stay. Okay, they're here to stay. You're not going to get more economic growth if you didn't get it in the past 18 trillion. You're not going to get it in the next 18 trillion. Okay, it's just the way it is. And you can sit here and tell me paradigm shift until you're blue in the face. Uh, no, because no government can ever print value for economy, uh, or, or I'm sorry, for the currency, and, and no government can create an economy. Okay, it ju if it could, we would have 18 trillion dollars worth of um, GDP growth. Okay, for 3.5 trillion of added deficits. But that's not the case. So that's just fairy tales.
And the sad part is that people are offered one, two, three, four different options to choose from as if these four options are viable, as if they're, they're something that you should listen to and debate in your head and think about. And No, no, forget about these things. I gave you the... Um, I gave you the plug and play right in here. Okay, this this is everything. You just plug it in, and see what happens. And I hate when it does that. All right, you plug it in, see what happens. Okay, if it's if imp if imports are uh, increasing, well, you're exporting dollars to the rest of the world. It's that simple. Okay, if government is funding the productive economy, then the bondholders are going to be the beneficiaries through the profit mechanism, right in here. Government uh, uh, income uh, dis savings equals profit savings for the top 5%. So the more you deficit spend, the more you're going to keep pumping inequality, the more you're going to keep pumping the top 5% uh, more with dollars. The more you, you give profit savings to the top 5%, the more they're going to go out and speculate in asset prices, and the higher the asset prices are going to go. The only problem is that the law of diminishing return at some point kicks in, and more and more is not enough, and they start to roll over, and it's game over, and they start going straight down, right? And everybody starts selling because the other guy is selling, and then you're in the fucking, in the shit, swimming, you know, doing backstrokes. It's game over. Thank you for playing. Uh, that's just the way it is. And as I, uh, as I always tell you, if you want to see who the beneficiary, the ultimate beneficiary of deficits are, just look who the bondholders are. Okay, because those are the people that are going to get those out of deficit dollars. Okay, and that's why they have the dollars, the savings to go and buy more bonds so the government can go out and print some more. That's the way it works. There's no other way around it. It's always worked like that, and it's always going to work like that. The only way that you can have a nice, sustainable uh, economy that's stable is when income. This savings equals profit savings, and then that profit savings comes back to the productive economy, and then that creates the income, the savings again for more profits. This is the loop you want to have, not this. This, this will never do it. Never, 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 never. All right, guys, that's it. I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.